part two of indoor gardening. Here we're going to look at uh, artificial light used for growing plants indoors. Um, if sufficient natural light isn't available, and if you have other than a south-facing window, uh, it probably isn't sufficient. Um, it can be supplemented or even completely replaced by artificial lights. Um, there are four main light sources that are being used as grow lights out there. Um, the first are fluorescent lights, both in tubes, the familiar, you know, four foot long fluorescent tubes, um, and compact fluorescent bulbs, little spiral uh, type of light bulbs. Um, one thing to keep in mind, the compact fluorescent bulbs um, shed more light uh, if they're mounted horizontally than if they're mounted vertically with the uh, the lights facing down. So they're mo they're substantially more efficient mounted horizontally. Sodium vapor lights are also used. They're similar to the orange yellowish street lights that you see. Um, metal halide bulbs. These produce a very intense light, um, but they generate a lot of heat and require special handling and fixtures. And finally, LEDs, or light-emitting diodes, are the newest source of grow lights. They're quite energy efficient and produce very little heat. However, at this point, they're still fairly expensive, though the costs are dropping rapidly as the technology of production improves. So soon, um, LEDs will probably be very competitive uh, with other light sources. Let's take a look at the light spectrum. Not every light source is suitable for growing plants. Uh, the light has to have the proper spectrum or range of light colors to allow plants to grow efficiently. Um, plants need some light on the reddish end of the spectrum. They need some light on the bluish end of the spectrum. So what they're looking at uh, needing is a balance of light. Now, the spectrum of a light source is called its color temperature. And color temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin. Red light has a color temperature of about 1,500 degrees Kelvin. And blue light has a color temperature of about 8,000 degrees Kelvin. Most plants do best when the light source is close to daylight which is about 4,200 to 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Metal halides and fluorescent bulbs can match this pretty closely, um, just naturally. You can check on most lights to see what the color temperature of the light is. Um, and that's true of, say, compact fluorescents, especially um, it's usually written uh, very plainly on the package. And you want a daylight temperature, something between 4,200 and 5,000 degrees Kelvin, roughly. Um, LEDs, each individual LED puts out a fairly specific color range. So in order to give the right spectrum, um, Individual LEDs that make up an, a uh, grow light um, can be different colors. There'll be some that are more towards the blue end of the spectrum, some that are more towards the red end of the spectrum, and together the overall spectrum that you get is closely balanced for plants. Um, sodium vapor lights tend to be at the red end of the color temperature scale and therefore are usually less than ideal uh, for indoor growing. Light intensity. This is something that is really critical and is often overlooked or done wrong with um, indoor growing. It, we'll explain a little bit um, why here. Sunlight falling on Earth has an intensity of about 1,300 to 1,400 watts per square meter on Earth. 
So every three by three foot square on Earth, when the sun is shining, is receiving 13 to 1400 watts, roughly, of intensity from the light. Now, think of a grow light fixture that uses four fluorescent tubes. Each one of those tubes is 40 watts. And let's say they're placed one foot above the plants. That would allow that fixture to illuminate about one square meter of growing area. Now, fluorescents generate about three times the light, the amount of light per watt of incandescent lights. So the effective wattage of fluorescence is about 480 watts per square meter. Now, the actual wattage is a little less than that because of light scatter and loss and that sort of thing. So we are, in fact, lighting our plants with a set of grow lights placed only one foot above the plants. They're still only getting about one quarter of the intensity of sunlight. It is very important to use very bright lights very close to the plants. What happens when you move the lights a little farther away? Well, that's where the inverse square law comes in. Now, this sounds all mathematical, and I know when you start talking math, some people's eyes glaze over, but it's really actually pretty simple. Light follows the inverse square law, which means that the intensity of the light is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the light source. That means every time you move the light away, a substantially less amount of light falls on the plants. So a simple way to think about this is if you double the distance from the light to the plant, the light intensity that reaches the plant isn't cut in half. It's cut down to a quarter of the intensity. So you're only getting one fourth the intensity if you move the light twice as far away. So here's an example. If we place a light six inches from a plant and measure its intensity, then we move that light 12 inches away from the plant, so we've doubled its distance. The amount of light striking the plant isn't one half the amount that it was at six inches. It's one quarter the amount that it was at six inches. If we move the light 24 inches away, now we're doubling the distance from 12 inches. It's only one quarter what it was at 12 inches, or 1 16th the original intensity, and we've only moved the light 18 inches. Again, it's very important to use bright lights very close to plants. Next, we need to consider something called photoperiod. Many plants exhibit photoperiodism. That means they react to changes in the length of day. This is one way that plants know when it's time to flower. And since some of the crops that we might grow indoors, strawberries or tomatoes or peppers or whatever, um, need flowering, uh, need to flower before we actually get the, the crop from them, it's important to let the plants know it's okay to flower. Now, plants don't actually measure the length of daylight. They actually measure the length of nighttime. <laughs> they contain a chemical which changes almost immediately from one form to another on exposure to bright light. But when the light's taken away, the chemical changes back to its original form quite slowly. So what happens is the sun comes up or the lights get turned on, then all of this chemical changes from, say, 100% type A to 100% type B, okay? 
Now we turn the lights off. It starts slowly changing from type B to back to type A. The plants know that if most of it has changed back to type A over the dark period, then the days aren't yet long enough and the plant shouldn't flower. So this has big implications for growing plants under artificial light. We have to make sure to give them the minimum length of night or day required to induce flowering. Most of the plants that we grow as crops will flower as the day length is increasing. So we may need to use timers or be sure to turn the lights on and off um, to give them a long enough daylight period or a short enough nighttime period that they will actually go into flower. Now we'll take a look at some grow lights. This is a typical fluorescent grow light fixture. Holds four bulbs. The bulbs are four feet long. They're typically 40 watt bulbs. Um, and if a light source like this is the only source of lights for a plant, um, so you're not growing in a window, but you're growing in a basement or in a dark room, then these lights should literally be placed a few inches from the plants. They need to be on some sort of a system, a pulley or uh, chains or some method whereby the, the lights can be raised up as the plants grow. That helps maintain that close distance without the plants smashing into the lights. In this photograph, we see some LED grow lights. And you can see here that multiple colors, the, the reddish and the bluish, are combined to give the full spectrum required. Um, they generate much less heat than virtually any other type of lighting, but they are more expensive to purchase. And these days, most grow lights wouldn't have a separate red head and a separate blue head. The individual elements in each head typically are mixed. Metal halide lamps are lamps that are used for a lot of purposes, not just grow lights. They're common in automotive headlights. Um, they're usually the types of lights that uh, are used to light athletic fields at night, football fields, baseball fields, whatever. Um, they operate under high pressure and they require special fixtures. They also contain mercury, so they have to be disposed of as toxic waste. Um, they require a warm-up period of from 5 to 20 minutes before they produce the full light output. Also, if they are turned off, um, either on purpose or by accident or by a power outage, um, they require a cool down and reset period of up to 30 minutes before they'll turn back on again. So if uh, the lights are accidentally turned off, let's say there's a power outage, but you leave the uh, power turned on to the light and then the power comes back on, the lights may never turn back on. They won't get that proper cool down period. You actually have to remove the power to the light for at least 30 minutes um, before they'll be able to fire back up again. This is a photograph of a typical metal halide bulb. The base looks normal, but it's actually a little different than a normal screw and light bulb. And uh, the power feeding it, the whole fixture is somewhat different. Here we see an indoor garden. Um, these are being grown under a combination of fluorescent and metal halide uh, lights. And you can see a range of uh, containers here from these plastic containers that are obviously not made for specifically for growing plants to the uh, pots in the back that are, uh, you know, these back here are specifically made for plants. These containers are not. This one is. Um, the key, though, is if you use a container such as the such as these plastic ones that aren't specifically made for plants, 
They really should have holes drilled in the bottom uh, to allow the water to drain out. Otherwise, the uh, bottom of the container can be waterlogged. And while the top begins drying out, um, you end up with anaerobic conditions, lack of oxygen in that bottom layer, which can start causing bad smells and things like that. Um, remember from our unit on compost, how the compost had to be aerated to keep it from going anaerobic so that we can eliminate uh, bad smells. Same situation here, except that if that soil at the bottom of one of these containers goes anaerobic, um, it may well hasten spread of disease through the plant or through the container and uh, damage the plants. So now that we know a little bit about the growing methods and we know a little bit about lighting, um, what are some of the crops that are suitable for indoors? Um, well, just about anything can be grown indoors provided you can provide it with enough space and enough light. But those are the two things that will limit what you can grow. If you have a south facing window or you use artificial lights or use a south facing window supplemented with artificial lights, you can grow a lot of crops and then space becomes a limiting factor. Um, some of the cops, crops commonly grown indoors include herbs, basil, rosemary, chives, thyme, parsley, things like that, because they typically take uh, less space because we don't use them in huge quantities. Um, and most of them are better used fresh, so they make a great indoor crop. Leafy vegetables like spinach, lettuce, and arugula, again, not necessarily tons of space, fast growing, um, and can provide repeated uh, harvests before we have to pull the plants and start over again. Small root crops like radishes, carrots, and turnips can also be grown. Um, some legumes like bees and peas, beans and peas uh, can be grown, but space may be a limiting factor as some of these like to get quite large. And then larger crops like tomatoes and peppers, um, if you have the space and if you have the light, uh, can be readily grown indoors. Um, one of the issues that you'll run into with uh, peppers and uh, tomatoes and things like that is uh, pollination. There typically aren't bees indoors that are going to pollinate these plants for you, so you're going to have to do it by hand. Um, usually using like a very small paintbrush or Q-tip or something like that. A little beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but I wouldn't plant a tomato plant inside and expect to get tomatoes unless you understand the pollination. Other indoor crops? Well, in addition to plants, because we've been talking about plants, um, some animals can be used for indoor production as well. Fish like tilapia. Uh, they can be grown synergistically with plant crops with the fish waste providing fertilizer for the plants and the plants cleaning the water that's then recycled back to the fish. And fowl like chickens and turkeys are currently produced largely indoors in specialized buildings. Um, mass production of chicken and turkeys typically doesn't take place outdoors. It's done almost completely indoors. This slide shows an indoor fish farm. This is a slide that we've seen before um, in another unit. And in this case, uh, this is actually happening inside a greenhouse. And you see the uh, tank that the fish grow in, the uh, aeration system to pr help provide enough oxygen for the fish. The water from these uh, fish tanks gets pumped through a system and is used to water all of these plants that you see growing along the other parts of the greenhouse. Um, that provides the nutrients that those plants need. While those plants remove the nutrients, they're filtering the water, and that filtered water then gets returned to the fish tank. Another thing to look at, green walls. Now, this isn't strictly a food producing garden, though they can be. Green walls are becoming increasingly popular type of indoor gardens. Um, they freshen the air, 
They provide sound deadening. They're attractive to look at. And depending on what's grown in them, they can produce food. They're a type of vertical garden, something that's been done for a long time in containers. And the plants can be planted in patterns, much like a living painting. Take a look at this. Who wouldn't want to sit there and kind of gaze at that wall and enjoy the uh, fresh air and oxygen being generated by that? As I mentioned, there's a video that discusses some of that that's part of this unit. So that ends this unit.